Yeah, hi guys. I'm surprised that there are so many people. <laughs> um, just the question, uh, are there some physicists in the room? I know at least that, wow, okay, I have to be very careful what I say. <laughs> but you are the minority, so... Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, I was told to show this first, so I will do that. <laughs> Cool, huh? <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, please use, use this hashtag on Twitter. Okay, <clears throat> so basically I, I just have three points on my agenda for this talk. Uh, first of all, I, I will explain you a bit why I think it's important to talk about this connection or possible connection between neural networks and artificial neural artificial neural networks and um, statistical physics. Then um, the second point will be um, what has been done or what people are doing uh, in, this, in this direction and how, how this, this is done, so how people try to, to connect the two uh, areas. So, <clears throat> so we will start with, with the why and uh, I want to talk a bit about why theories are important in general. So, is there somebody who knows this guy? Sorry? Who, who is this? No, who said it? You. Please go out, you know too much. <laughs> yes, that's correct. So, this is Tycho Brahe. And uh, so, Tycho Brahe basically um, was an astronomer. He was a Danish nobleman, he was very rich, so he could do whatever he wanted to do. Um, and uh, yeah, basically he was passionate about, um, about observations. So he observed the, the orbits of the planets and uh, he accurately um, had written down many, many, many measurements about his observations. So he was really driven by this passion to accurately observe how these planets move <coughs> and, and uh, how the Earth is uh, moving around the Sun. So, we can say that what he did, because he, he, there was no theory, okay? He just observed and then he, he wrote down what he, what he observed. So, basically what he did, he collected facts nothing more, um, but he collected facts. And uh, so people sometimes think that um, to have, to make predictions for something, so to predict the weather or predict uh, um, what, what will be the next shopping tour of you and your girlfriend or whatever, um, you need a kind of a theory, but that's not true. So you can predict just uh, based on facts you, you collected before, okay? So he was able to predict the orbits of the planets just based on the facts um, he collected before. The measurements he collected before. So he was able um, to, to predict. Now, <clears throat> the point is that when you um, collect facts, that's, that's correct, then, then you can do predictions based on that fact, okay? But, um, of course, you can only make predictions based on the facts you collected. So, um, but probably there are um, a huge amount of facts you didn't observe so far, and these unobserved facts could basically change the way you would predict something, okay? So just having collected facts doesn't mean that you are able to accurately predict something in a given um, setting. So that's why um, it is important to have um, theories. Because if you have a theory, uh, you are not forced to collect all possible facts to have a, um, let's say, an overall view of the world or a, a good view of the world um, that makes you or that puts you in a position where you can predict something accurately. So if you have a, if you have a theory then of something, then you have all facts at once. 
because this theory covers everything, let's say. So um, it covers not only the, the facts you have collected in the past, but it also covers all the unobserved facts because uh, with help of this theory you are able to make um, a st to give a statement about something, about a, a specific situation um, without that, for example, that you have to do a measurement. <clears throat> so theories, of course, can also predict unexpected new phenomena. I mean, there are, um, in the history of physics, there are um, many, many examples um, you can find where uh, a theory basically was able at the end to explain something which was not um, understood before. So a theory basically make the word explainable. So it gives you the what, which basically is related to fact collecting, but it makes the world also somehow understandable. So it e explains you why. And uh, um, <coughs> if we are with uh, Tycho Brahe again, so he collected all these measurements, but um, sometimes later um, Newton basically established his theory of um, gravity and he could explain all the orbits at once without measuring them, but um, there was a way to understand why these um, planets move in a specific way around the Sun. Okay? So a theory puts you in a much, much better situation than just collecting um, facts. Now <clears throat> we have somehow in, in uh, machine learning or uh, when you think about artificial neural networks, uh, we have a similar situation at the moment. So basically we are collecting facts, right? So there is no theory uh, which tells you how exactly these systems learn in a sense that you can predict um, how robust the system is, how, um, let's say, uh, how a system would um, react on a specific input you give to the, to the neural networks. You have to do the measurement, you have to do the experiment, you have to input the data to see what is the result. There is no meta theory, there is no theory that allows you to, to, to make these kind of predictions. Okay? Now you can basically map the situation, so the collected facts in, in an in a artificial neural network situation where you train a network to classify something, so you have a fixed set of classes and you want the network to learn um, to, let's say, classify correctly uh, objects or whatever, animals or whatever, then the collected facts are the weights. So you input the data, the system learns somehow, and at the end you have the, the weights and uh, these weights basically uh, they, they, they form the model if you want. Okay? But of course you know that if for example if you, um, if you give the system the wrong data to train, bias data or um, statistical, um, not statistically not representative data and so on, um, then probably you have a lot of unobserved facts and uh, this basically can cause a lot of troubles and one, one kind of these troubles are these adversarial attacks where you can game a system that for example it or you can force a system to wrongly classify um, an object. To make this a bit more concrete <coughs> I have this um, nice video. So yeah, you basically you, you, you have the problem of misclassification or unexpected system behavior um, if, if, uh, if we just train our systems, our neural networks based on, on the data we have. So we don't know how robust they, they are. For example, we don't know how robust is an artificial neural network um, related to translation invariance when you when you basically um, or rotation so if you rotate an image does it work or not to figure out if it works or not you have to do experiment you have to feed the data to the system and uh, to see if the if the output is correct okay 
Now, um, there are some funny videos on the internet um, where people started to game these systems to show that uh, um, you can easily fool those artificial neural networks, especially when they are trained to uh, recognize objects on, on images. So this one here is very nice because uh, so here the system correctly classifies it as a banana. Now he puts an image of a toaster, so the toaster comes in as well. And now he puts something very strange and the banana basically becomes a toaster, you see? So this system is very easily fooled and it's not just a, um, um, a simple neural network behind it. So uh, this network behind that experiment was an Inception V3, so it's, it's a huge neural network um, which was trained to, to recognize different objects on an image. Now this small patch here, they, they basically they published a nice paper. You could print out the patch, this patch, so this, this strange thing here, and then you could do your own experiments and it worked very well. So you could fool the system um, very easily. Now basically what this patch does is it activates um, other units in the network such that the, the classification at the end basically jumps from, from the correct class to, to another one. You could generate another batch, then probably it would classify the banana as spaghetti or something else. Okay? So you can, there is a way to game these uh, systems. Now the, the point is that there is no way that you can predict these kind of things. You have to do experiments, um, you, you, you have to carefully then basically um, uh, you have to carefully basically then to create these kind of patches and so on. But there is no theory that can predict you, listen, if you do that and that, then for sure from the banana you come to a toaster or, or whatever. So, but of course people are aware of this problem and, and some people they, they tried with different methods um, at least <coughs> to make these systems a bit more transparent. So one way for example is that you um, have these kind of attention maps. So for example for this bird um, the neural network um, looks if you want so to speak looks um, at a different uh, region than, than for this, this bird. So what you have basically or, 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 or tools um, invented by people are for example these attention maps where um, you try to visualize local activation patterns. This helps you a bit um, to better understand how the system comes to the conclusion or how the system comes to um, such and such result uh, here as an example the classification. But these are all post hoc methods. Okay, so we basically um, you cannot you cannot predict before you do this experiment where the system uh, uh, looks at, so at what, what region the system looks. So the thing is that um, what I want to show here is that probably it's not a bad idea to have a kind of a, a theory which can help you to, to better understand how the system works, when they fail, in what situation um, do they, do they uh, correctly operate and uh, is your system, when you train the system, when you train your neural network, um, how much or how good is, is it um, generalizable that you can use it for new data and stuff like that. Okay? You, th there is no way today to do that, so you have to, to make the experiments and sometimes you don't have the time, um, you have to deploy the system. <clears throat> so it's, it's an interesting problem. So one, one way to do that is, um, so if you take the, the artificial neural network, let's say you have a specific architecture like a CNN or an LSTM, whatever, so one for images, another for language or whatever, um, then the idea would be that you try to map basically this um, architecture to a theoretical framework. And this theoretical framework could be um, outside of computer science. So it could be uh, something from biology, could be inspired by chemistry, 
or um, of course um, the best way would be that you are inspired by physics so <clears throat> um, now if you do that what what do you what do you gain if you do that basically uh, what 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 you gain is that um, you have a framework which is understood let's say as we will see afterwards we look at a a spin spin system spin models from physics and these systems are understood so uh, the variables you have in the equations are understood and um, the the dynamics of these systems uh, are understood so you you can predict something okay so that means that you can do some guided experiments and you get predictions or new insights you you can ask different questions based on such a framework than you would ask just having um, an artificial neural network at hand, okay? <clears throat> so the next step then would be that you do kind of an inverse mapping and this generates a kind of a hypothesis which you have to test to see if what you do here, if that matches really what the neural network does in, in a given situation, okay? So you would go back and you would test by experiments um, if what you get out here, if this maps or if this is true as well for your artificial neural network, okay? So this is one way, um, let's say one path uh, which um, makes, uh, makes sense. Now, of course, the, the difficulties, um, how do you do the, the mapping from, from this uh, um, specific artificial neural network to to this uh, theoretical framework and uh, so we do a very um, short intro into spin models um, so <clears throat> imagine that you have some uh, atoms or whatever physical uh, units and basically they have a char characteristic called spin now for us it's okay to think they have um, two different orientations okay one points up and the other down and uh, of course you enco can encode this up and down for example with plus one and minus one and then you can basically write down the the energy of the of the system and um, the energy basically this h h um, basically is a shortcut for hamiltonian um, is is based on two two terms so one term is an interaction term it tells you um, what is the the influence on the energy uh, based on the coupling of two uh, neighboring spins so you have these two spins and uh, they should um, basically here in both cases they they are up so they have the same value plus one for example and this gives you a contribution to the energy okay and then you have this j i j which basically is the coupling constant or the cop the, the coupling strength and uh, this can be a constant for all the spins but can be also uh, from a, from a given uh, probability distribution then the second term is is a term which basically um, is just based on an external field so for example when you put a magnetic field here and these are little magnets uh, let's say then of course this has an influence um, as well now um, when physicists study these kind of systems they are interested what is the probability uh, with a given setting to end up with a given configuration of spins so this sigma here is really a configuration of spins so this sigma could be for example plus plus minus minus plus and so on okay and uh, you can calculate this probability with this expression and um, this expression basically comes from the fact that you assume that every possible configuration in the system is equal probable okay <clears throat> so based on this this is a model this is a model and based on this model you can ask some interesting um, questions so for example what is a typical configuration um, uh, you can ask uh, uh, if beta is changed, beta is related to the to the temperature. So beta basically is the inverse of the temperature. So you can ask uh, what what happens then, or you can ask. Uh, so if this guy um, is spin down, what is the probability that this guy spin down as well, or this guy as well, and so on. So you can ask a lot of nice questions, 
And uh, based on this mathematical expression here, uh, you can calculate then in principle um, the answer, um, which is in, in, in this case um, not easy to do, let's say. Now, <clears throat> the thing is that um, there are physicists, they, they think that this kind of, of uh, framework are suitable to better understand neural networks. And so here the problem we have is we could not do a mapping here directly because this sigma, so the spins, sigma um, i is, is discrete, so it is either 1 or, or minus 1, right? But, for example, if you think um, at a neural network, then this does not work out because you have, uh, uh, let's say, your weights, and your weights are continuous variables. So that's why there is um, a kind of a, um, a more general uh, spin model, let's say, which is called a, a p-spherical model, which, um, <coughs> never mind this expression, but basically which basically uh, incorporates the the uh, uh, the fact that all these sigmas can have uh, are continuous variables, okay? And it is called spherical because this boundary condition over there, the sigma squared um, summed over all the spins has to be one, which means that the energy is bounded somewhere. And uh, uh, um, this is also where the name comes from. So it's a it's a basically that the model is based on a on a p sphere in a in a <coughs> And dimensional space. Now there was a, um, a group, a research group, they were able basically to write down an expression for um, a neural, artificial neural network, um, they called it Y, and uh, what you here see is this X, Y, J for example are the inputs, then the A, Y, J are the paths of all possible um, so if you have a neural network then you have these layers, you have the connection between the um, let's say kth minus 1 to kth layer um, with the i in, in one layer and the j in the other layer. So you have many different paths you can walk through and uh, this a i j basically is nothing else than if a path is um, on or off. So as you know um, normal neural networks have an architecture such that you don't have connection uh, within one layer, okay? So just between one layer and the next. And uh, this way, way uh, WIJ are the, are the weights and you have the product here because you have the assumption that these weights are um, independent, which of course is, is not true, but as a um, as an ansatz, as a first ansatz, this, this makes sense. So what they, what they did in their paper, I gave you here the reference if you are interested. So what they did basically, they mapped this expression exactly to a p-spherical spin, spin model. And uh, this is exactly <coughs> um, what we discussed before. So they had, they wrote down an expression uh, for this artificial neural network and uh, mapped it to a framework um, in physics, here this p-spherical spin model. Then basically they did some guided experiments. So <coughs> what they did, they were interested in so-called metastable configurations. You can think of it like uh, you have a lot of minima and maxima in this, in, this, in, this, in this energy landscape. Depending on all these variables here, um, this um, energy defines a kind of a landscape, how, depending on the, on the, on the variable um, and on the distribution, this, I, um, this Ji1 uh, to uh, Jip, uh, which in their case was a Gaussian, uh, Gaussian distribution. So depending on, on, on the setting, on the variables, you have different, you, you generate an energy scape with different uh, local minima, maxima and so on. And uh, what they hoped is basically to see that um, this corresponds to, the, to the, the, the loss surface of the artificial neural network. So um, as you know, when you train uh, an artificial neural network, you have a loss function, which defines you the error, let's say, which then is back propagated through the net to adjust the, the weights in, in a way that um, in the next round, the net will better perform on the task um, it should. 
So um, <clears throat> they did this kind of inverse mapping. So they, they, they hypothesized that these metastable states in this p-spherical model basically is the same like the, the loss um, surface um, map in, uh, for, for loss function for neural networks. And then they tested it. So they tested it if this really corresponds to um, the loss um, landscape in, in, in with their real artificial neural network. And they were specifically interested in the number of local minima which are um, present in, 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 in this specific architecture. And they could show that the local minima they got here called metastable configurations corresponds nicely to the number of local minima so the distribution of local minima um, in, the, in the case of artificial neural networks okay so this is one one example um, what, what people did it's it's um, it's uh, it was one of the of the of the first of that kind it was uh, four five years ago and since then people of course uh, uh, physicists tried to 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 map other models or try to, try to use other theoretical uh, frameworks. Okay, so <clears throat> to have a summary, um, first of all, neural networks are not yet fully understood. Sometimes people tell me, yeah, this is commodity now. Um, I really doubt this. It's commodity from an engineering point of view. That's true. You can download a pre-trained model and you can use it more or less, that's not difficult, okay? But it's not fully understood how the system really learn. And um, it's not fully understood um, in terms of robustness. So how robust are the system against, uh, um, against some perturbations and stuff like that. I mean, probably you know this one pixel attack as well. So who knows this one pixel attack for neural network. So basically you have a neural network which, which um, can classify different objects on an image and you just change one pixel in the image. We cannot see it. But uh, of course the machine perceives it because uh, there's just one number is, is different than in the original image and you can fool the system by this simple um, perturbation. Okay? So they are not fully understood in that sense. From an engineering point of view, probably yes, how to use it and, and uh, how to deploy it. Well, sometimes not, but um, yeah. Then, um, yeah, so a mapping to a known theory gives much more intuition, intuition and insights for, for robust architecture because you can use this insight to design more robust systems which are um, not that prone against uh, perturbations. And I think that theoretical physics could make a valuable contribution or valuable contributions in that sense. And I have a book recommendation for you. So if you are really interested in, um, in these kind of things, then um, uh, Nishimori, he published a really nice book about, about uh, information processing in general and uh, spin glass, spin glass models. So this p-spherical model basically is one um, one candidate for a, or is a, is a spin glass model. Okay. Yeah, that's the end of my talk. I wake up, please. So <laughs> thirty minutes. It's a <laughs>